ship to shore, from storm to feast, from fear and longing to fish and loaves, and a multitude hungry for wisdom and light and truth. And they found it in Jesus, God's invitation, inviting us to seek the God light within that brings to the surface compassion, concern, care for the other who hungers for life, for loaves, for love. Hello, I'm Rory Hamilton, the minister of New Kilpatrick Parish, and thank you again for the time you make to invite us to share some time together. Last week we were on the high seas almost in a storm on Galilee Loch. We find the shore this week where Jesus and the disciples sought a quiet place. It didn't last long as the crowds found them and followed them and were fed the word and fed by the word. It's the feeding of the 5,000. And with them, once more, we wait with hungry minds and mouths to be filled with love and loaves. Let us worship. Holy God, in the moment of our questions and longing, may we meet you, ready to feed our wonder. Holy Jesus, in the place of our intrigue and fascination, may we find you, ready to challenge us more. Holy Spirit, in the courage of our doubts and hesitation, may we know you, ready to take us beyond where we are now. For Jesus, 
You are God's invitation, God's provocation, prompting, stirring of all we have come to expect and then flipping it over, making us see again from a different angle, hearing again from a different voice, understanding again from a different perspective. In that creative place where our ears are tuned to different voices that speak into a changing and diverse world, may we find ourselves and find ourselves alive, rekindled, resurrected in an ancient story that sounds new to our souls. Holy God, holy space, holy word, may we hear and listen, learn and reimagine, reshape and renew our faith, our life, our church. Our Father, who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. A triplet of stories today that might seem disconnected and, and rather random, but in truth they all speak into each other. The disciples set out on their mission, the beheading of John the Baptist and the feeding of the 5,000. But nothing is random in the Bible. The Gospel writers place stories where they are because they are making a point by being in that order. It may not be altogether obvious, but we will explore that a wee bit in the reflection. But, but listen now and wonder at these three and what they say about each other. But a quick note about numbers, there's 12 baskets left over which illustrates the 12 tribes. But in the equivalent story where Jesus feeds 4,000, there are seven baskets left. Seven reflects the seven Gentile nations. And the feeding of the 4,000 takes place on Gentile territory. But that's another story. Then Jesus called the twelve together and gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases. And he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal. He said to them, Take nothing for your journey, no staff, no bag, nor bread, nor money, not even an extra tunic. Whatever house you enter, stay there and leave from there. Wherever they do not welcome you, as you are leaving that town, shake the dust off your feet as a testimony against them. They departed and went through the villages, bringing the good news and curing diseases everywhere. Now, Herod the ruler heard about all that had taken place, and he was perplexed, because it was said by some that John had been raised from the dead, by some that Elijah had appeared, and by others that one of the ancient prophets had arisen. Herod said, John, I beheaded, but who is this about whom I hear such things? And he tried to see him. On their return, the apostles told Jesus all they had done. He took them with him and withdrew privately to a city called Bethsaida. When the crowds found out about it, they followed him, and he welcomed them and spoke to them about the kingdom of God and healed those who needed to be cured. The day was drawing to a close, and the twelve came to him and said, Send the crowd away, so that they may go into the surrounding villages and countryside to lodge and get provisions, for we are here in a deserted place. But he said to them, You give them something to eat. He said, We have no more than five loaves and two fish, unless we are to go and buy food for all these people. For there were about five thousand men. And he said to his disciples, 
Make them sit down in groups of about fifty each. They did so, and made them all sit down. And taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven, and blessed and broke them, and gave them to the disciples to set before the crowd. And all ate and were filled. What was left over was gathered up, twelve baskets of broken pieces. This story is such an iconic tale. Everyone knows it. The day Jesus expanded a picnic to a banquet. How great is Jesus? But my problem is that was then. He doesn't do it now. We have this story that has made Jesus the miracle worker. When the miracle isn't much use to to folk in St Gregory's Food Bank, for example, or the good folk down in Drum Chapel and St Mark's struggling to give children a hot meal. Miracles, miracles are only signs pointing to a bigger truth. Miracles are actually questions that ask, who is this that does that? Not how does he do it, but who is it that does that? The focus on Jesus being a miracle maker would have been probably missed by the first hearers. It really wasn't a huge concern to them because in those times, you know, so many people were claiming supernatural powers or claiming to be divine. He wasn't the only wonder worker around or the only person claimed who claimed to be Messiah or even the Son of God. I mean, nearly every Caesar did that. The miracle was perhaps not quite so impressive to them as it seems to be to us. Remember, the Gospel writers were trying to illustrate who this person was. And it wasn't the miracle that did that. Think of it this way, and this is from Willie Barclay. Everything Jesus did was a picture of God. So when Jesus touched the leper, he was saying, God loves you like that. When he included the children, he was saying, God loves you like that. When he ate with tax collectors and sinners, he was saying, God loves you like that. When he healed the sick, fed the hungry, included the outcast, he was saying, God loves you like that. So this story of feeding 5,000, what part of it says, God loves you like that? Being fed? Because that's not the reality of God in the world today. We need to reimagine the story because the disciples have just come back from their sending out. They had stories to tell, questions to ask and challenges to speak of. They needed to debrief. So Jesus says, let's get out of here and find a deserted place. And they go by boat, perhaps giving the impression they were going somewhere the crowds couldn't follow. But <laughs> you just see them running along the shore, can't you? Following the boat, pointing it out to everyone. And when Jesus eventually comes ashore, he had little time with the disciples before the first of the crowds arrived. And then... He puts the needs of the crowds above the needs of his disciples. He healed and tended them long enough for the sun to start sliding down the sky. And in the story, when you ask, who is that? The answer is, that is the compassion of God. God loves you like that. But the other part of the story is that Jesus has just heard John has been beheaded. The great banquet of Herod for sport took vengeance on John. The little people were simply for their entertainment. Now swap the scene and you have 5,000 of those little people gathering round a simpler feast where everyone's needs were met. Total contrast. One is the feast of the powerful of empire and the other the feast of the kingdom. God loves you like that which is the miracle of God. Because gods, generally, were more like Herod's. The philosophers' gods, well, they were cold and dispassionate. They were known as the first cause, the unmoved mover. Romans and Greek gods, well, they were, as we know, immoral. They were selfish. They exploited humans as playthings. So when we ask the question we are meant to, with all these stories, who is this? You get a surprise. Because this is the one who does the opposite, gathers the needy, 
heals them, feeds them, and wait for it, has compassion on them. God loves you like that. Jesus constantly strips the religious world of its normalcy. The stuff we expect, Jesus challenges us to reconstruct. Everything he does, we end up asking, who is this? He dismantles what is considered sacred and holy and socially acceptable. He redefines what it is to be human, that we are valued. He shatters conventional understandings of God. I was down in Drum Chapel again this week, and it really hits you how ill-divided the, the world and the church is. They have a small session there, half are under 30. There's no lack of ideas and ambition for their community, which they're doing everything they can to support and care for. But the fight they have to do anything is shameful. Lacking resources, support, plans. It just doesn't work for them and and steals away a presence that is creative and and compassionate for their neighbours. On the other side, in a couple of weeks, we'll hear from St Gregory's Food Bank, which we have been supporting generously for a time now, but a story where we emphasise a God who miraculously feeds 5,000 is is useless to us because we can't say God loves you like that when our neighbours on either side of us still are hungry, still needy for so many things. Especially when he just turns around and says to us, well, you feed them. If the question to ask is always, who is this? Might we, in responding with compassion to those around us in our and the next parishes, say, well, God loves you like this, by keeping the story, keeping the miracle alive. Who is this? The one who says, the last come first, the sinner is forgiven. The prodigal receives a banquet, and all enemies are loved. Who is this? The one who finds wisdom through folly, strength through weakness, power through humility, life through death. Who is this? The one who dismantles our normalcy makes his up clean and unclean, finds good in the sinner and life on the margins. Who is this? The one who responds non-violently, disrupts our history, shatters our assumptions and deconstructs our dogma. Who is this? The one who unbinds our absolutism, bankrupts our certainty, unfetters church privilege, redefines our creedal formulas. Who is this? The one who uncovers, undoes, unfolds, unfastens a sacred anarchy. Who is this? This is Jesus. Thank you for your invitation, as always, to to meet together like this and worship. The number of activities, as always, happening. Of course, this is the beginning of our anniversary year, and next Sunday we have an anniversary service uh, reflecting the 375th anniversary of becoming a parish. The moderator will be preaching in the, the church. We're going to record some of that, and we'll put it on to the video. The video might be a bit later next Weekend, we might kind of try and splice in some of that. So it'll be the Sunday afternoon before that is uh, published. But um, you can keep up to date with all of that in our bulletin, which comes out. It's online. You can get it by email or by post. All these different ways. Just let us know how you would like to receive it if you aren't already.
We have Heritage Weekend coming up uh, at the second weekend in March and we have an NHS concert in the third weekend of March and we have the Passion Play on the Tuesday of Holy Week in March. Um, all part of our anniversary but lots of things going on there so please do join us if you can in whatever way you can um, but through all these times we create community because that is what we're all about always turning outwards or trying to at least not always doing it well but always learning how to do it better so let's gather these thoughts together in our prayers for others let us pray It is among our hope unfulfilled for a fairer world, for longing for justice for all, our desire for all to be fed, that we pray. In the not yet, the unfulfilled, that we bring our prayers for our world. And it is simple, O oh God, food for all, peace for all, Hope for all, opportunity for all. Our shortest prayer on the longest road. So we pray for ourselves, for a change of mind, a different worldview, a new belief that changes us and our intentions and our living. That such a change changes more than changing others and their decisions. But a change of how we invest in the world, how we touch the world, how we build relationships, how we speak and think and value things. Less feeding ourselves and more feeding others. A change of heart, perception, intent. There is our prayer, and we make it generously, sincerely, and dare travel the road that gets us there. And as we do, we carry with us our families and friends, those ill mentally and physically, and their carers, those grieving, those hurting, those frightened, in our own community, and the world, in Gaza and West Bank and Israel, Ukraine and Russia, Syria, Sudan, Myanmar. Our prayer, our journey, your compassion. So be it. Amen.
Go in peace. In the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the common life of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen.